Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Jacqueline P. Jack Attack. Jack Attack. Jack Attack. Well, hey, Stevie, I guess you Do you start, want to start the show? You start the show. You want me to start the show? Yeah, you're going to spearhead this show. So you can look anywhere you really want to look. We've got a 360 camera going, that camera, and just whatever, yeah. We just talk to these guys, yeah. yeah just talk to us and <laughs> record the whole thing. Okay, hey, let's do this. Yeah, okay. so Stevie, this, this one's you, Stevie. I'm throwing grenades at both of you. I know, it's, he does that a lot. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Steve Andes here. We're here with the Thought Exchange. We got JB in the house, Jacqueline Stop. Bailey, uh, and my co-host over there. Hey, it's Cameron Barkey. How's it going? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, Jacqueline, we uh, brought you on the show. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, actually, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us who you are and what we're going to talk about here today. <laughs> you put me on the spot He's there. You that's, the spot, yeah? That's, yeah. that's how the grenades work. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you call this the hot seat. You're in the hot seat. You're yeah. just going to get rapid fire questions thrown at you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jacqueline Bailey. Um, Claimed fame is I sell real estate. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I grew up here. Actually, I grew up in St. Albert, in Kay. the bubble of St. Albert. Ooh, where? I this grew guy grew up in St. Albert. Yeah, I'm St. Albert. I grew up in North. Uh, I live in North Hertz now. I grew up in Heritage Lakes. Heritage Lakes. Oh, I was opposite of you. I grew up in uh, Lacombe. Oh, that's where my husband grew up. Hey. Lacombe. Where Lester. Was? Lester? <laughs> that's funny. I was in, uh, well, he's obviously, he'd probably be watching this. I, don't I grew know. up on Lindbergh. Limburg. Yeah, Limburg. Great, Cross, great crescent. It is a great, great crescent. Great crescent. I legit, great I, crescent. I legit miss it. I miss I mean, the bubble. No, you do not. I, I do live a there. Bit. It's it's interesting. I lived in I lived in St. Albert for a little bit, and it's literally a decision to leave. Like it's nine o'clock. You're like, do I really want to go downtown? Do I really want to go somewhere? Oh How yeah, you live there home? too. Yeah, I lived there for five years. And you lived in St. Albert. Like, yeah. yeah, man. I used Where? Where did I live? Erin Ridge. Erin Ridge. The new Erin Ridge. Yeah. Yeah. That's not St. Albert, man. Yeah, man. The new Aaron Ridge. Like, you lived past in, the fire no, station? You lived Dude, in I was living there in like 2008, 2009, that's 2009. That's not St. Albert. It's not St. Albert. doesn't count. No, yes, it is. Those, no, that's not St. Albert. Those are like those new little things that go up and... What's that city called then? I don't know. They're just phony. They're not real St. Albert. He's, just, he's just trolling me. I'm not trolling him. That's <laughs> not St. Albert, man. He's not count, he doesn't count as St. Albert. <laughs> no, man. As a current St. Albert resident, I'm uh, very aware Aaron Ridge is part of St. Albert. It is, but there's like, the, the, like that used to be Farmer's Field. You know, over <laughs> it's by, right uh, by... It is right by the farmers. Like, the house that I was living in literally outside the fence. I know, it fence, went right a, to a farm. It went to a farm, and now it's like the Costco and all that other stuff that's out there now. Yeah, man. That used to be a dirt road. Yeah, it was a dirt road. Yeah, you know, know what? St. Albert used to be a whole farm, farmer's field. I guess know? every city in the planet used yeah. to be something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. Grew up in St. Albert. Yeah, That's grew sweet. up in St. Albert, still live in St. Albert. Mm -hmm. Moving into E-Town, though. Thank God. You're moving here? Yeah. Yeah? Westmount. Yeah, Rapid. Westmount's sick, yeah. Yep. Now, now everyone knows where you live. Yeah, I'm not telling my address on here. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I grew up in a really big family. <clears throat> Absolutely love this city. I don't love the cold. Love working here. Love traveling, you know. So, how? okay, so you got into real estate. Yeah. So, um, from what I remember, you were working a shitload of jobs. I met you when you did your wedding. So, that's how, yes. that's how I met you. Uh, I met you in, uh, where was that? Silver, Silver Tip? Silver okay. Tip. And yeah. in, uh, in, uh, that's when I met you, a silver tip in, in uh, Canmore. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were working, when you were for that wedding, you were doing like 10 jobs. Yeah. I remember you, you said you had like 10 different jobs. <laughs> Man, I'm a workaholic, so yeah. I always had like a million jobs. Um, but I was working at Kennedy Architecture, which is an architectural firm downtown. Yeah. So we did like all the big towers downtown. I worked for, I was the EA for the, for the principal. And then I was working at Cactus Club, and my gosh, like any anything I could do to, you know, swindle some cash. <laughs> I was doing it for the wedding, to be honest yeah, yeah. with you. And then, um, but yeah, that's when I really fell in, in love with real estate was when I was working there. And I, then that's kind of what segued me into my career today. Well, the big thing is, is that like you, you really kind of went into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's the kind of the, the big thing that they kind of see is like you really kind of took business by the cojones and just basically like ran with it yeah. and just chose real estate to basically be in. Was it like, did you have any real estate background before jumping in? Like what, like how did mm. you fall in love with real estate? Like, or was it just like, how did, like how does that, how does someone all of a sudden become like saying, that's it, I'm going to sell houses? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I, uh, my school background is business, and I majored in marketing. And I thought I was going to go into sports marketing. I worked for the London Knights Hockey Club for two years and thought I would segue into that. And then my husband brought me back to this wonderful city, province. I was in. To which the London? London, that's Ontario? Yeah, it's You're Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you out there for? Oh, uh, two and a half years. Is that WHL? Yeah. Or uh, no, that's OHL. OHL? Ontario. Yeah, yeah so the yeah. W- yeah. WHL. So, anyways, or it's a CHL. CH, no, it's the CHL. It's pretty high. It's like a level below. No, no, no. The so the CHL is the Canadian Hockey League, and then the WHL, the Western Hockey League, and then the OHL. They're yeah. all part of the they're CHL. They're all part of the CHL Canadian Hockey League. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's wild. That's cool. Yeah. So it's like where everyone gets drafted to go play in the NHL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like that's high level. How did yeah. you end up in that? Just from your school and marketing? Uh, and yeah, just like networking, and uh, yeah, I got the job and I applied. I think there was like 500 people that applied for That's what I'm saying. That's it. a big time job to have. Yeah, it was fun. Honestly, I learned a lot. I met a lot of cool, really, really cool people. Um, traveled with the team. You know, some of those players, I still call friends. You know, they work, they play for Toronto or Philadelphia. A lot of them got drafted. Oh yeah, a lot of them got, well, like five of them got drafted. <laughs> That's a lot. The rest That's of them. a lot, no five NHLers, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's not what it was about. It was about like the people aspect and the excitement and everything was different every single day. And you know, come into work and you never knew what to expect. And you know, things would be like throw you curveballs, and it's just like everything was so fun and it just didn't feel like a job. But it, it really takes over your life, though, though, because the schedule is kind of like you are now subject to their schedule all the time, right? Oh yeah, I mean, like you, Eat I didn't have, I didn't have life. Yeah. <laughs> my life was school and hockey, um, <clears throat> but it was so fun, and I really enjoyed it. And I think the part of it that I enjoyed the most was um, the fact that it was different every day. You didn't know what to expect. You know, you always had to pivot when things didn't go perfect and things like that. So yeah, yeah. it's a kind of very transferable with real estate. And um, I used to watch like trading spaces and like, you know, all those extreme home makeover shows when I was little instead of watching like, TV shows. <laughs> so I always loved it. Um, my dad like built home, built homes. And so I always kind of was always around me. And so I always loved interior design. I was like, oh, I'll be an interior designer. So I had all these ideas of what I wanted to do. But then when it came to real estate, everything kind of came full circle. Yeah. From like a marketing standpoint, from an entrepreneur standpoint, you could run your own schedule. You know, everything's different every single day. You never know what to expect. Um, It's challenging. You know, you're, you can, there's no limit. That's what I love about real estate too. Push yourself as hard as you want to go, make as much money as you want to have, um, and it's all up to you. So um, I love that, how there's no ceiling. And um, and I get to work with people every day, like every single day. I get to work with awesome people every day, you know, help them find their forever home, and it's just like it's a very rewarding career. So, I mean, I love what I do. What do you think the most important part of, of like, uh, that kind of a business is? Is it more like product knowledge or is it more like relationship and like uh, people skills? Uh, I think it's definitely a combination of both. Um, The relationship piece is key. It's number one to develop that trust. So, you know, if you do say something about the home or about the neighborhood or about the pricing or about anything, there's, there's no uncertainty there because the relationship has been established. So relationships are key everywhere, but in Edmonton especially, relationships are like paramount. So it's all about referral, it's all about relationships, establishing strong relationships um, and making sure people trust you. And you know, it's, a, it's their biggest financial purchase they're ever gonna make. Yeah. So it's, you know, you can't beat around the bush about it. You have to know your stuff. Yeah. You have to know everything, but I would say relationships first and then product knowledge is second, but the two go hand in hand. You still need, you still need both, but the relationship piece is number one. So how, how do you find clients? Like how does like, do people like, is it strictly referral based or do you have to go out there and basically like, Hey, hey are you selling your house? Uh, <laughs> 
Can hey, I be your realtor? This is a nice house. Can I? You're going to make her divulge all of her secrets, eh? Live on air. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. there's no secret Edmont sauce. Edmonton's a, uh, it's like a really big, small city. Or like, it's like, it's big, but it's super small. Everyone knows you know what each I other. Think, you know what I think, though? <clears throat> it's interesting, though, because I don't, I don't, I, I think it's pockets of networks is what I think it is. So like when you're in a specific network, you know everyone in that network and everybody knows everyone in that network. Mm -hmm. So like, so like I'm connected to your network and a lot of the people that you know are the same people that I know and same thing with you, like some of the people that you know, but then there's other networks that are out there that we're not even like, I don't even know who they are. You know? I don't know. Can't we're, even touch we're, them. Can't, can't even, even touch them. Can't like, even reach which them. Which basically could be running at like, like parallel to yeah. us like there could be pe there's people walking on the street that are on the street i've never seen before in my, like not that i don't see them i'm just you're not i'm not in that network i'm not in that vibe with them and you have to literally tap into their network and then you get all of those people into your thing does it make sense mm -hmm. so it's just it's just interesting that like i find that my network is always like this almost the same as the kind of people that you know and the kind of people that you know and we kind of all interact together within one's kind of like a hive mentality I think Edmonton has a whole shitload of these fucking networks that like don't touch each other. I think we're always like two people away from someone you know. Like if you meet someone on the street in Edmonton, you know, you ask them a few questions, then you end up knowing, you know, that same person yeah. and then, you know, that you connect with another person. So I feel like no matter who you meet in Edmonton, if you ask the right questions and you, you know, spend some time with them, you're going to know at least one person right. that, you know, that's the same. I can it, agree with that, yeah. And I just feel like Edmonton is a small city. I mean, you can't go anywhere without running to, into somebody that you know. Um, and it's just the way that it is. It's our, our lifestyle too, right? Like, we, I love being downtown. You guys love being downtown. You know, we go to the same restaurants. We go to the same coffee shops. You know, you're running into same, the same people. That's the thing, too. There's only a certain amount of places to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's actually so small. Like, in another We're major so metropolis. Limited. Yeah. Like, There's, like, so many I've different I've never been spots. to that restaurant before. Yeah. Like, in another, like, go to New York, a big place. It's like, holy shit, this place. But here it's like, yeah, I've been there, done Uchilinos. that. Yeah, knows. <laughs> uh, hey, you know. Yeah. If, if we say names, we, they got to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, have to, sorry. I'm joking. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a paid advertisement yeah, from... They're not going to like it when we send them a bill. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be like, what's this for? I'm like, yeah, you were on the show. Jacqueline Bailey. Jack, <laughs> Jack Jacqueline Bailey. Jacqueline Bailey. I whispered. I whispered Jacqueline Bailey dropped, dropped, dropped your name on the show. It's my favorite restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she dropped your name on the Make show, sure so go. we have to send you a bill. Huh? <laughs> no. Actually, just keep speaking them up, and the bill will keep getting higher. <laughs> Let's do a whole segment on them, and then yeah, we'll keep do a whole segment on them, and be like, "Yo, what's this bill for?" I'm just like, thought "Guys, you have a whole segment a thought exchange because there's a whole like, segment on it." And I'm just like, "Oh, you I guess what? I guess maybe we should pay for this one." <laughs> do you think if you did that and you just sent people bills, like, well, we talked one about that. Every ten, would they we just pay it? We like, talked okay, about cool. that with the, with with like Nike and stuff like that. Like whenever like you oh, put yeah. like a thing or you just send them a bill, that the big companies they wouldn't even like. Would they would would they think twice? They would just see a bill and they I would really see it? hope that they have intelligent accounting systems where they do not pay bills that they don't have to pay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying though? You just send them an invoice. Yeah, just send <laughs> she's looking no, at us like, you yeah, guys, like, stop. Just send this them an is invoice. Not, <laughs> right? It's not and, it says, and it's you know it says episode three. <laughs> do you think Nike if we send them a hundred thousand dollar bill, they'd pay it? Well it doesn't have to be a hundred thousand dollars. Please e transfer. <laughs> Ten thousand dollar increments. Well, I got this. I got this uh, every month. Every month. Well, this came. This came from. Uh, I got this sick Nike logo that we put up in our house. Like, That's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. And then we're gonna do the the podcast outside of our living room because our place is pretty sweet. Uh, the Marchand. No, 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 no. It's when we. There's an actual hole in the wall. We, we decided not to do it because yeah, it was we like. Yeah. So dirty and, and disgusting yeah. as, a, as a place. It just looks like an absolute castle. Like, yeah, it looked like a. Dude, why do you keep telling people this? I just it's a gross, nasty place. Anyways, we had this Nike logo, and we're like, yo, if we do the the podcast here, like they're getting free advertising. Yeah. What happens if we just send them a bill and a link to the thing? Be like, yo, you're on our show. You gotta pay us. <laughs> you gotta pay. Yeah. I don't think it works like that. They'd probably be like, yo, you have to pay us. Yeah, like, actually, yeah. vice versa. Yeah, it'd be a big vice versa. Yeah, yeah and then we'd have to. And then all of a sudden, all the shows would have the little blurs <laughs> in the back. We'd have yeah. to blur. Have Just to move blur. the check mark like the other way. Flip it the flip other it. way. So yeah. it's I think someone owns that one too. Oh, they do. Yeah. There's a guy who does like phony Nike shoes. I forget. And he flipped. And he just flipped the thing. Yeah. He made, yeah. It looks really sick. Yeah. He got in a lot of trouble for that. Um, yeah. I, I just mean, watched a little documentary on this guy. I forget his name. Forget the whole thing. But, where's he from? Uh, I think uh, it's either Los Angeles or New York. 
Okay, the States. The States somewhere, yeah. He does really cool Nike shoes, like custom ones, but they're not called Nike. They're they're under another moniker. But they're the logo's upside down and backwards and something. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty Did dope. you um have you ever seen that 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 uh, the documentary about um, the marketing scam that the guys did for their movie? Fire? No, not fire. They basically what they did is they, they had a movie and then they trashed their own movie. So they literally like put out posters and stuff and then they went in there and basically said, this movie's bigotry and this. And, that, and they put all of this like negative press towards, negative press towards like their posters. So they put all these posters up and they just bashed the shit out of their own movie saying it was a piece of shit. I can't believe that they said this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And like created yeah, this massive, ballsy. massive shock factor. And people were like, whoa, like what, what's What this, about this movie? What is, why is this movie getting like so much, like why are people hating on this movie? What's this movie about that it's like so bad and so this. And they basically sold out every, like every night because people just wanted to see what the hype was all about. See, that's insane. That's the power of marketing. But they did it to themselves. Like yeah, that was crazy. Smart. That was the craziest thing. Like they would just do the bat, the back, uh, the backwards bash. On that, that. could have gone totally the opposite direction though. Like that was a ballsy marketing move. Like say your shit totally sucks and like this is racist and bigoted and whatever. <laughs> and we like, and then people could women like, and this and that. And like they were saying all that type of weird shit. Yeah. And then they basically put it out there and then let people go watch it and <laughs> it doesn't have any of that stuff in it. Oh, people would have been pissed then. They'd be like, what the hell? It's like a family movie. Yeah. yeah that's it's funny. like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're doing real estate, Edmonton. And yeah. you're doing... How's the market right now? Mm, rough oh. times. Yeah, everyone's like, how it seems to be having... I think there's a transition going on where like a lot of people are shifting careers. Yes. And because everyone's shifting and moving around, that there's like this down period and then once everyone mm. shifts and moves and there's going to be a settling and then everything's going to go back up. But I definitely, I definitely think that's what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think people are forced to get new careers right now. I think yeah. with the oil feed field, people are, so many people are let go, so many people are laid off. So people are like literally forced to pivot into a different career or go back to school or whatever yeah. that is. I think the biggest thing right now that we're seeing is... Uh, I mean, there's, from the real estate side, there's so much inventory, so much lack of buyer confidence, so many restrictions that are working against people getting financing. Our government, I'm not getting into it, but... You'll, he'll get fired up. I'm not getting into it from a political standpoint, but it's hurting us. And then... Um, uh, well, you can't just say, like, what are they doing that's hurting? No, I, I really can't. <laughs> um, and then the, and then the buy <laughs> You know, nothing is safe here. You know that, right? I know, but like, I can't have political views. Um, and then the pipeline is one of the biggest things that doesn't necessarily um, directly affect the real estate market, but people are like not making any big moves until that's solidified because oil is such a big... Um, aspect of the economy in Alberta. It's, just, it's all a big power move, though. It's against like, that's the weird thing. Is like you have all these big, huge power companies that are like, first of all, everyone's pissed off that their boss fires them, and then they blame the government for it. So the boss is like, yeah, I don't really. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not really making money. So you're gonna have to go. They're making money. They're still making money. They just basically. They're not... They're Stevie, they got to look after shareholders' interest first. That's the uh, first and foremost. With these big billion-dollar companies, they only care about shareholder interest. That's yeah. the first thing. So yeah. who, how, how do you protect those guys? Yeah, so the way that they basically keep the money in their pocket <clears throat> is by firing everybody else. So basically, loyalty has nothing to do with anything. So Well, they don't have jobs for those people, right? Like they do they have jobs. They just don't want to... The do. work's not there. No, the work's not there. Yeah, there's it's too many, there. though, too. There's too many, yeah. too many people in that industry. Right. But they're moving, like even companies are moving their oil businesses to Texas. So that's what we're experiencing right now is co big companies are actually moving their business out of Alberta and moving it into the States. And why is that, Steve Van Deest? Well, because uh, they're the getting government? taxed Is that here. because of the government? They, yeah. They're getting taxed here. For the government. Yeah, hmm. because they don't want to, they don't. Well, the thing is, is that who owns the oil? We own the oil. But do we get the benefits from it? No. The company does. So like, well, so, no, this is what we're doing. So why, why, why doesn't the government just basically say, okay, all you oil companies, beat it, and we're going to now open up our, like, our EPCOR style 
because they company can't. in there in there and basically rehire all these people. The people are here still working. They can still do the jobs. That would just be just a, kick an them all out. Gong show. Yeah, it's gong show. That's that's you gong think show. so? Like, if you oh, kick yeah. everyone out and you basically just oh, yeah. like all of all the money that basically makes from the oil just goes directly back to the people. It doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that. Why not? Sorry, Stevie Van Dist. Like those like if the government like just kicks everybody out. Those companies own the land that the oil is on. No, the land is owned by the Canada. They rent it. Like when you buy a house, you don't own the land. You have to pay taxes on that land. You have to pay to live on that, to have a house on that piece of land. So Stevie Dundee, you're suggesting that the government goes, hey, XYZ, multi-trillion dollar international corporation, you're out. We're going to take this now. Well, doesn't that what they do at West Edmonton Mall? When, they, when a company makes money, don't they boot them out and they, they open up their own company? What happened if the government did that to your company? It was like, all right, Viva, fuck you and you, you're done. Uh, <laughs> we, we got guys that can run this for you. Would you be upset or how do you feel? You guys, this won't actually fucking happen. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So <laughs> this is just like the dumbest... It's all, no, no, but that's what it is. <laughs> it's conversation this ever. Because the oil <laughs> companies, that just that's won't happen. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally just not going to happen. Yeah. The only reason why the pipeline's not going through is because it was poorly managed. Now they want to put it through um, an indigenous colony. The indigenous colony is upset because they don't want it going through. They now want to purchase it, but it's federally owned. So it's just a, it's it's a, a political it's a, it's battle a, at this it's point. It's a big gong show of over yeah. who's going to get the money. That's what it seems like, because like you're right, the indigenous company that wants to put it, put it across and send it to the, to the, uh, Vancouver, the West Coast. Yeah. Now West Coast is saying, because Vancouver is like, no, we don't want any f ship ports that high up on the, on the coastline. So you can't port your ships here. And so they're going, what the fuck? Like, I can't put a ship up here to collect this oil. And they're like, no, you can't do it. Because so they're, they're worried about the whales. What are they? They're worried about no, the whales. Are, yeah, no, they're yeah. worried about the whales and the shipping route. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but like here from our Alberta perspective is like, okay, I care about the whales. I love whales. I'm a vegan. I love whales. But I care about people over whales. You know, like let's do something to like figure out the whole whale thing because there's thousands and thousands of people that are losing their jobs, foreclosing, yeah, but these, but going these, bankrupt. But these thousands and thousands and thousands of people were not here before. They all have come from like not all Nova Scotia. No, like not everyone all. migrated here to kind of do it. And they're pulling the oil out way faster than they did in the 80s and in the 90s. They're pulling it out way faster. And if they put a pipeline in there, it's going to even accelerate that process. Like right now, they're pulling out the oil faster than they can sell it. That's the problem. So they're like, we need a pipeline because we're pulling out 400, what is it, 400 uh, um, billion barrels? What is it, like, how it's like a huge number like that? And they can only sell 300. So they're just like, we can't get it out of... We can't get it out of Alberta fast enough. That's not the problem. <laughs> we, we're not, yeah. She's not allowed to say the problem, though, I don't think, are you? No, probably That's not. not the problem, though. <laughs> There's no, yeah, no political opinion. Um, but re regardless, let's just, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. That um, the government has played an effect on oil and the housing market, correct? Because which direct, yeah, which, which is directly affecting the housing the market. Housing it's going, market. I think it's going down one step at a time. So you have the oil, which would make the majority of the money. Then the housing markets, which people are buying houses from that, and then what's what's going to be the next industry hit after restaurants are getting hit now? Restaurants, restaurants are, are not getting hit. Restaurants are actually fine. They're not getting hit. Um, uh, restaurants are kind of getting beat up a bit. Same thing with the reason why the small ones are. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. A little bit, like the more the mom and pop ones, mom and pop but ones like can't keep up. Cactus Joey's, Bottega, like all these people are always drinking. In Edmonton, guys people expect to build, by the way. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> people ha always have money to go out to di for dinner and always have money to drink. There's nothing really else to do in Edmonton. And that's why, because I worked in hospitality for so long, we would go through the highs and lows of the economy and we wouldn't really be affected by anything, you know, because people still had to eat and people still drank. The things that are getting hit are the car industry, um, housing industry, you know, uh, the construction industry, because things have really slowed down. Um, uh, like clothing, like Victoria's Secret is closing down 130 stores. Because, what? Yeah, no one's buying. They can't buy $500 bras. Well, not 500 but they're $500 bras. $500 bra? No, but everyone's <laughs> buying things online or they're buying things from Australia now or they're buying things from Europe. Like no one really needs, like I think malls are really going to suffer. There's a mall over by Calgary that's like completely, have you ever seen that or heard of it? No. It's completely empty. And there's a, it's a massive debacle. 
Like there's like I think one store in there. Wow. And there's an entire empty mall just outside of Calgary. Whole whole like five hundred like thousand. Like the outlet? Are you people. talking about Crosstown? No. No, no, no. There's a whole new one that went up. No one's taking any space in it. They can't afford to. Yeah. It's yeah, not deer. It's not the deer, the, the deer foot one. Is I don't it? know. I'll like, look it up after the episode, or you look it up on your phone. I'd figure the name of it. But the thing. What, is, do, what do I look up though? Just look up uh, vacant mall Calgary, and the thing's crazy. But yeah. So there's all these factors that are contributing to Alberta. Kind of, we've lost a little bit of that Alberta advantage. I'd say. I think so too. Yeah, but that uh, directly and indirectly affects your niche and your market. Correct. Totally. I mean, it just affects people's ability to spend money. Yeah. Um, they're not making money. <laughs> you know, everything's going up in price. Mm-hmm. You know, like we're kind of, you know, we're kind of, we're in a tough situation. Yeah, we and are. And I think 2019 is going to be a tough year. Um, what we're hoping for from a real estate forecasting perspective is 2020 is going to start being, becoming you know, we're not going to be in decline anymore. Mm-hmm. We're going to actually create more stability and, you know, start. Are, are the banks playing a role in uh, uh, the real estate market being a little bit tough? Yeah. So they started, tre- st- uh, it's called stress testing people for mortgages. Um, stress were, testing? Yeah. So we're actually in the process, we, not me, but um, they're in the process of actually you know, going after that and removing that because who isn't stressed? <laughs> what do you mean stress testing people? Like, um, here's a polygraph. Are you stressed? Yeah. So basically, no. they, they say start making these bill payments and they try to push to see how, how hard they can put the bill payments. Yeah. So they would kind of take you out of a realm of like your afford, like your what you could afford and then push you kind of a little bit past, yeah, that. past that and to see if that was something that you could afford. So they're stress testing people to see what they can afford. Um, and the biggest thing that I, I say as a person who has a mortgage and everything, like there's so many stresses of life that aren't just money. It's relationships. It's like how your day went. It's like how people that you met, what are you, or eating, and how what are you eating, you know, how are you feeling? What are you reading? You know, there's so many things that make you stress. It's not just money. Mm-hmm. So that's why I don't think it's a true indicator of people's ability to afford a home. And so that's why, um, that's one of the reasons why they're going after it is removing it as something that people have to go through when they're going through the mortgage process. So basically what happens is, is that they would, they would say, okay, I'm going for a $300,000 mortgage. And then they'll, they'll punch in the system and see if you can handle a $350,000 mortgage. And then, you know, see what that kind of looks like on your lifestyle. Yeah. Like I'm not a mortgage broker, so I can't really speak to like the details of it yeah. but they do kind of push you to you know a place where you know would that be uncomfortable if um inflation went up this amount you know if your if your bills went up you know due to inflation this is what that would look like could you afford that stuff like that so they really they're you know, saying this to the client like the, yeah. the potential home buyer yeah. or they're doing it to the mortgage broker to you and is it passed along um, like it's a combination of working with the mortgage broker and the client. Yeah. But I'm I'm not a mortgage broker. I don't know all the okay. details of everything. Mm-hmm. But I do know that it's something that actually, I mean, it just sucks. They're just making it really hard for people to get financing. And then that's denying a lot of people then, because they're not yeah. passing these stress tests. Uh, Is yeah, a- yeah. And the banks have just made it really hard for people. They're just really, just like all of us, you tighten know, them, or tighten, tighten their purse strings a little bit and, you know. And the banks are and they're just waiting to see yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, wouldn't the bank, I know this uh, may sound kind of ridiculous, wouldn't they want to give out more houses and then want people to default on them so they so can, they can buy get back at a dis- dis- discount? Have your money and your house? No, because we're in a recession, basically. Yeah. So if they give people a $320,000 loan, and say they foreclose on it in Less than a year month. and a half. <laughs> a year and a half, they, they lose. And now that house is worth 300000 mm. Well, the banks lost money, yeah. you know? So they have to protect themselves to make sure that they... That the value of the house the stays value, the same. Yeah. Right, because they don't want to basically... <coughs> where I think the banks are actually started doing, which was interesting, I don't know if they're still doing that, where they're doing the reverse mortgages, where basically, like, old people can't sell their houses because, like... They they have these multi-million dollar houses and they can either only give it off to their offspring 
or like try to sell it, but then nobody can afford their house. So they do what like reverse mortgages on those mm -hmm. houses. Oh, what's that called? The bank's paying you? The bank buys the house back in Slowly? hopes that, that you're going to die before they pay off all the house. So if you pass away, then they, they take, they own the house and then they become like a, so they pay you like a, a monthly payment, like a reverse mortgage. Jeez. Yeah, in hopes that like. I've heard of it, I didn't know yeah. what, have you ever heard of that, Jacqueline? I haven't had any clients that clients have done that, that but I have heard of this reverse mortgage thing. Yeah, it's almost like it's like a, turning them into like the biggest real estate agents in, in the country because they, they would own all the houses, right? That's wild. So in this, in this economy, Jacqueline, what are, uh, I don't know, let's say, th what are three things that you're doing that separate you from other people in this current climate that's kind of maybe not ideal? Which are other things that you like, don't, you don't need to divulge all the secrets, but like maybe getting back to the basics or you picking up the phone more, or is there anything else that, that you'd suggest or that you do? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, if you can make it in this market as a real estate agent, <laughs> you're, you're gonna be fine when things get actually good. Um, everything takes twice as long. Every deal you has to be handheld the whole time. Um, the biggest thing that differentiates our team from um, a marketing perspective is we're very heavily on social media. So my business partner, Caitlin, and I are very prominent on social media. It's something that not only differentiates us, but it gets, in, you know, it's what people are doing. People, people are, are holding it, yeah. their phones, you know. So it makes us almost relatable where people feel, you know, that they kind of know us almost mm -hmm. so it makes it a, um, like a very smooth there's trust conversation and yeah. yeah there's already trust already and built. rapport it's almost like meeting a stranger for the first time but the, with social media it doesn't feel that you don't feel like they're your stranger it's almost kind of a little weird where they actually yeah. know more about you than you actually yeah know. how do you know so much about me i've yeah. had that happen before have you i'm sure oh you my gosh like all the time really? but honestly i throw my life out there so yeah. it, it's not like i'm surprised i'm like oh my god how do you know my dog's name it's like mm -hmm. no i I'm very aware Open, of yeah. how much I share on social media yeah. um, and it's worked. It's really worked. We've gotten a ton of clients, builders, um, a lot of people just approaching us because they say, you know what, I like your vibe. I kind of like, you know, your style. I like the way that you're, you know, because we're not old school realtors. You know, we, we changed the game a little bit. Um, we spend way more money on, on listing a home than any, uh, anyone else would do. We do really expensive photography, videography with Steve. We do like custom feature sheets. We do like insane social media marketing and, and targeted marketing. We do uh, tag marketing. We do so many things because Caitlin and I, both of our schooling background is marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we're very, our brain just goes into how do we that mode. This better, yeah. yeah. And how do we take your property and differentiate it from all the other properties? So we don't treat every property the same. We say, okay, this is a marketing plan for this property. This is the demographic. This is a target market. This is our marketing strategy. This is our marketing plan. This is what we go after. And so that's what differentiates us. A lot of people don't do that. They just no. go all willy nilly into no. the thing and like, we're going to sell houses. Post we it on uh, MLS and then just wait. And then leave some, it and wait to see wait what happens. someone calls. Yeah. And like, you, we, you just can't do that in this market. You have to really work hard for the sale. So, because there's so much inventory, how do you take that one house when there's 100 homes that are listed in that same area? Yeah. So how do you get that house in front of people's faces? And is it more people are selling their houses because they can't afford them anymore? Uh, no, no, not uh, not our personal clientele. Yeah. No, because you, you, you're dealing with more like luxury clientele. So like, I, I don't even know if that's even, does this even affect your market? Um, it's just harder to find them. There's a smaller pool of them yeah. right now. So that's what we're dealing with is there's a small pool of buyers that can afford that 800 plus home. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. Um, the other thing is people, buyers are just, they're just not confident. They just want to, you know what? They're like, you know what? Because you don't spend know that whether you're going to buy a house and it's going to drop on yeah. you. Yeah. You know what? If we're going to spend that kind of money, maybe we should wait six months. Maybe we should wait a year. You know yeah. what I mean? So. And that's what we deal with. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a valid point. However, people still need homes. People still need to live. Uh, what we're dealing with is people that are um, upgrading. 
So if they're in their first home, they're going to their second home or third home. Mm -hmm. So they're moving up, which is nice. So we're able to sell their home for a reasonable price. Maybe they lose a little bit of money on their home, but maybe but they, they make, make like more on the bigger house. You know, they'll get that house for a hundred grand less in this market than they would four years ago. So mm -hmm. it's really a buyer's market right now. A hundred percent. So yeah. like, so like, it might be tough to sell a house because you can't. There's so many houses to sell, but like, buying houses right now is like for cheap. Well, not cheap, but they're like you, they you can you can upgrade right fairly. You can upgrade your house right now if you want to up. If you want to upgrade your house, tallest girl. She'll, uh, Do it. she'll upgrade you into one of those eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar houses and save you a hundred thousand bucks. Yeah, I mean it's insane. <laughs> it's just the way that it is, and the pricing and pricing and presentation are the most important thing. So well, it's all about feeling, right? Yeah. Like, it, like if anything, when you're buying like cars or houses or any of those big purchases, it's how how it makes you feel. So if you can make yeah. people feel some kind of way when they get to the house. You know, if they show up and the house is all raggedy and yeah. pillows and whatever, or half empty, there's nothing in the house. It doesn't feel as nice as if it's. Well, a lot of a lot of real estate agents they connect uh, smells with their home, which then puts feelings. Like they'll put baked cookies in the oven and make the place smell like cookies. Like mm -hmm. that's a oh, you thing, just right? dropped you just dropped some some knowledge, bro. Well, yeah, no, it's just be ba people baking do that cookies stuff. now all over the place. Yeah, well, I don't know. I've never <laughs> sold a house before, but I know that people, I know that's something, it's like a neuro-linguistic programming. If you can connect an emotion yeah. with a feeling during a sales process, like when someone walks in and they're just like, wow, this place smells like cookies. Hey, hey, Stacy, don't you make these cookies? Hey, it smells like your mom's. In there. And, you know, they get super stoked about it, right? Like there's yeah. that feeling and an emotional attachment to the sale. But you were saying... Uh, there was two P's there. It was price and presentation. Yeah. You said those are the two most important. Like price mm -hmm. number one. What What about price? Does it fit their their sort of uh, the buyer's goal or whatever? Or what What about price? That would be from a selling perspective. So when uh, we take listings now, we're very, very, very blunt about what the price needs to be in this market. It's not, you can't blame the agent, you can't blame anybody. We would love to get you as much money as possible. But the thing is, it's like, I always compare it to stocks. So if you bought a WestJet stock for $400 today, and tomorrow it dropped to 300 you can you sell, sell it for 400 No. No, you can sell it for 300 So it's the same thing that's correlated with real estate, is it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. So we, the market dictates the price of your home. You might have bought it for $600,000, but the market dictates that your house is worth five fifty. Damn, and people have an emotional attachment to that and they don't understand. They don't they understand. Price. What, I paid 700 for that? Yeah, I got that problem right now. Yeah. I have a condo up in Spruce Grove. I've been sitting on it for almost 10 years now. I can't get it, I can't get it up. Like I bought it at the peak. At the peak. And uh, and it was a dumb move too because it should have pulled out right in the thing because the the price changed at like right at the thing and they were giving back the the deposits and I'm just like what you're gonna do that because they basically you bought it in at two years prior to the to the to the to the peak but then what ended up happening at because the market went up so high that the basically the builder said no we're not selling it for that price anymore you're either gonna have to buy it at the new price listing right now. Or you take your deposit back, so they take everyone's deposit. I don't even know if that was actually technically legal, but they took everyone's deposit, built the houses, the market went, the market went through the roof, and then they basically said, "Whoa, we can sell these places for way more than what they're worth," right? So then they gave a whole bunch of people their money back, right? Because they, people said, "Fuck you, I'm not buying it then," because you're changing the price on me. And then the, as soon as they did that, the market just went. Poof. Oh, so they made their money and then screwed everybody else? Well, yeah, because they were just like, so if they were to sell the house for the, the condo for, let's say, um, for uh, 180, let's say, but then the market went up and it went up to 210 or 220, there's a $40,000 gap there that they feel that they're losing on like multiple amount of units. Mm -hmm. So instead of honoring the, the 180, they said, no, we're going to sell them for 220. You want it still or you don't want it? 
Oh, and you went into it on and yeah, and people, yeah, and people, people kept it because the market was doing this. Oh. So people were like, "Oh shit, I want to, I want to lose out on these deals." And then all of a sudden, as soon as the deal went through, the fucking market just came right back down. And so Damn. like everyone's houses that they bought for like two twenty are now only worth like one sixty. And then no one wants to sell. And them you can't sell it can't because sell you're them. just like fuck. Like you don't want to take that hit. That's I'm like, like that's a heavy an hit. astronomical amount of money too for yeah. a small condo. That's a huge drop, right? Like, uh, like dropping like fifty thousand, forty thousand dollars. Like, that's happened to a lot of people. A lot well. of people, man. So now people just sit on them, and you just like pay your mortgage and just hope that it climbs back up. And it hasn't. It's been ten years. It still hasn't climbed back up. That's the condo market. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So condos just, would be yeah. Condos totally different niche, eh? condo market is really taking a hit right now yeah and not only that but now the unit is like it's getting beat up it's no longer brand new it's 10 years old it's got renters in there it's got renters in there that's good though you got renters though yeah but the whole place is filled with renters man all the owners that bought that place bought it as an investment so it turns into like a fucking no one gives a shit about it a slum dog dog millionaire you know (laughs) you know it turns into like one of those uh may what is it what is it mid mid renters whatever it's called oh yeah don't uh, don't say the name you can i don't even know what it's poorly about them yeah no i don't i know what you're talking about but it's just like yeah so like all of a sudden like the whole place is turning into like a full-blown rental it's not a condo because condos people own them and they live in them and they care and they care about them but renters don't they'd be like oh i pay rent here i'm just like it's not mine i don't understand that do you understand that logic Mm -hmm. like if someone rents a place and they just like they spill something on the carpet and don't care like it's not mine or whatever like they just like smoke in the unit and trash it i think Mm -hmm. i I think it's just a personality level though at that point it's a character thing it's a character thing because you're not you don't have ownership. You have not even at that level yet of buying and owning something. Mm-hmm. So you basically you're just like careless and free and don't don't care. I don't understand that. Thank and you so the peop- so people just basically just run that level that lo- that lower vibrational frequency, right? And just do weird stuff. Like I've do like in our like in our unit. Like I'm on the board. Like I'm. On- <laughs> I'm like the president of the board. How funny is, is that, eh? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. He's the president. You're the president? He's yeah. the president of the condo. <laughs> he goes to these meetings. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. These meetings and stuff like that. And, and, and the stuff that goes on there is just like, you're just thinking, you just shake your head because you're just like, what is going on? Like, you're just dealing like you're like a babysitter to people. And you're just like, how, how, how do people live like this? You know, Steve, like. That is not ideal. No, it's not. It's a bad, I mean, it's a bad situation. It's Good thing you got the Marchant. Hey, 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 take it easy. That hole, that dirty, nasty hole. <laughs> it's a hole in the ground. Yeah. So Jacqueline Bailey, we're talking about real estate. We're talking about um, uh, what to do in this market. Yeah. Right? You're talking about price. Yeah. Well, what about presentation? And what about price? We kind of sidetracked. Yeah, what do people need to do in order to basically like... Oh, man, they just got to be re- realistic. Like if you do want to sell in this market, you just have to be realistic. And it'll go? And uh, sell? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're realistic about price, you have the right real estate team um, helping you present the home well. Photography is one of the most important things because people are house shopping for themselves online. Mm -hmm. Um, And staging, making sure everything looks really nice, and that's our forte, that's what we do. But um, yeah, I mean, we won't take listings if people aren't aren't, um, realistic about price. You're straight up with the people too. You're like, I'm not going to take your listing because this is prices out to lunch and I don't yeah. want to deal with it. Yeah, not that we don't want to deal with it, but we don't want to disappoint them. You know what I mean? We want to set realistic expectations from the get-go mm-hmm. so that there's no, um, not hard feelings, but you know, they want we want to make sure that we're doing our job properly. Mm-hmm. And so we're being really honest with them from the get-go. And uh, you know what, some people want to, don't want to hear it, but they do want to hear it, you know? So it's just like, you say something that, you know, you just, our job is to just give people information. That's what our job is, to give people factual information and so that they know that we're not just pulling that out of the sky. You know, we have factual information that we show them that dictates what that pricing strategy is. Yeah. Um, so we're not going in there and be like, yeah, your house is worth, I think, based on looking around 550. Yeah. You know, like we do price per square foot, what's in the neighborhood, you know, all those like different analytics that we go in through to price a home. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, is it hard to have those conversations sometimes when, you know, you have 
a divorced couple and they're splitting up and they're that's gotta be the worst losing Dealing money with, like, on their home and you know our job isn't all fancy and fun you know we show that on instagram but we deal with <laughs> we deal with some hard situations we you do should put, you should put a hard one up one time be like guys it's a total switch here you go so you'd be like this, yeah just be like when they're fighting in the background just be like just take a selfie and be like clients are fighting right now and <laughs> clients are fighting <laughs> This one's a, this one's not pretty, guys. This one's not pretty. It's gonna be tough. Like ding ding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's just it's not all. There's some gritty ones there, hey. Yeah, and just like heart wrenching ones, right? We are human. We we're not robots. We're human too. So we do have a certain element of like uh, compassion for those certain situations, and you know we do our best to help um, hold their hand throughout the process. But then it, the the hard part about our job too is. You know, we don't control the market. The market controls the market. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's not all amazing and fun and exciting all the time. We deal with some hard situations and, you know, you cry with clients and you're empathetic and, you know, but then there's the other clients. It's our first time home buyer and, you know, you get to celebrate them with them and open a bottle of champagne in their new house and, you know, make those memories and be a part of those really special moments. So um, there's more of those. That's got to be, that's got to be probably most, I would imagine, as a realtor, that would got to be the ideal market or clientele to have or people that are buying homes because it's easy at that point because all you really, all you're really doing is basically trying to f- listen to the client what they want and then go and shop mm-hmm. and find it for them and say, what do you think about this one? And it's good. And they're like, yes, I want it. And you'll be like, perfect. Because yeah. you already know how much they want to spend. You already know. All you have to do now is just go find it. Unless they go, yo, I want a, want a huge mansion, but I only have like 150000 or 200000 to spend. And be like, they don't exist. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So. Um, but how do you find those clients? Because like, I would imagine that that would be... That would definitely be relationship-based, I would imagine. Totally. And I think with, when you're working with buyers, because there's so much inventory, you know, say they give you a budget of four hundred dollars to $500,000, they give you six neighborhoods, there's 50 houses in that realm. Yeah. Um, working with buyers is just a process of, of elimination. You like know? you really have to take them to like two or three houses that you know they're going to buy. You have, like honestly, you should be going out max two times and having maybe eight houses, knocking them down, getting it down to two, and just letting people make the decision. On their own, yeah. Yeah, um, because buying a house is... You should throw a third one in there as a throwaway. Yeah. Those ones are always nice. Or, okay, yeah, Ryan like, like, a, like a really bad one that you just like, this is in the neighborhood, this is... So they look at it and be like, I definitely don't want to live in this one. You know, like just a throwaway house. And that way they left with two, but you give them three. There's a different philosophy about doing it the other way too, like yeah. showing them something that's out of their budget. They do, they do that, hey. These and then, geez. yeah, and geez. then, <laughs> and then bringing them down to more reality. But then they like, you know, it's just about really educating the buyer, right? Because everyone's like, oh yeah, my god. Yeah, but I don't know. But then that would create it. Like for me, if I went to a place and I'm like, I love this place and I can't afford it. Then I'm gonna be depressed. Well, then you, then I you buy the next one. The middle one. That's yeah. re- retail sales do that. Yeah, I know. But then now I feel now I I don't. I, you know how if you're talking about the sense of feeling, when I'm when I go to that second house, I now don't feel like stoked as it? stoked for it, like as opposed to like if you just like push it just slightly enough that you know that they can afford it and you know they're gonna love it, but like show them too that they're kind of like yeah oh, it's okay. And I'm like this is the one. I'm like this is perfect. This is one. It's a little bit more than what you wanted, but I'm like, I'm sh- like, I, 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 I work the numbers out and I think you can afford it. Then they'd be like, I want it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's the idea of like buying a car or like buying a pair of shoes. You go a in, you're like, shoes? you're like, with shoes? Retail guys do oh yeah, you're like, you know what? I just need a black pair of heels. And like, yeah, okay, you can have these ones. Or you can have like these ones. And you're like, well, you know what? I don't really want mm. those ones. And then they bring you a pair that's in the middle and they're like, oh, but then... You could have these ones that are, you know, they have that aspect of it, but they don't necessarily, you know, are not going to fall apart in two they're seconds. Yeah, but good. they're not like, because you're making them feel really shitty about the price. Because it'd be like, oh, I don't want to pay fucking three hundred, five hundred. Not making you sh- feel shitty about the price. You just say like a, like one or two talking points on the real super nice ones. Be like, yeah, you, yeah. you can get those ones. 
And then you show them the real shitty ones, and they're like, you could get those ones, but you got these ones. And they're kind of in the middle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then you're like, you know what? This house has aspects of that one. You'd like talk about that. But like, you know what? This isn't your budget. You could do, you could fix this, this, and this. It's going to cost about blah, blah, blah. So it's just, it's this psychology. It's very calculated, though. Yeah. This isn't by accident. No. No, a lot of learning went into this. Yeah. What are what are some? <laughs> well, no, she's dropping like yeah. she's dropping some jewels some on not, sales some right not, now. Some knowledge. What are, what are some uh, books that you read that you could suggest to our audience? Let's say three, three actually top five books. Jacqueline Bailey, top five books. Does it just mindset or doesn't even have to be fully real estate? Maybe two real estate books if you've read any. Okay. Like, I don't even know if there are like real estate niche specific books. I'm sure there are. Yep. But what are top five, and then two of them are like real estate books. Um, okay, so I'm really big on like motivational people, mm -hmm. speakers. So yeah. Brendan Bouchard wrote a book called Maximize Living. It's like one of one of a really, really good book. Yeah. Um, Ryan Serhant is my real estate idol. Yeah. He yeah. wrote um, a book called Sell It Like Serhant, which I read twice in two days. So those are two real, uh, one real estate one book. One real estate book, one motivational mm -hmm. book. Sell It Like Serhant? Check, yeah. Check your mic. It's off. off. Turn it on. Why did it turn off, Stevie? I don't know. Why did you turn it off? I didn't. How did I turn it off? It's covered. Check, check. Yeah, you're good. There you go. Okay. Sorry, you were saying? Um, yeah, I read audiobooks. So which one am I reading right now? I forget the title. I just listen to them in my car. Yeah. And... Um, That's what I love doing that. Uh, there's a book. It's for the girls. It's called Girl Wash Your Face. It's by Rachel Hollis. Girl Wash Your Face. Yeah. Yeah. What's that one about? Uh, it's just you know. It. I mean, it's for girls. Like. It's about. Are you, oh, assuming, girls are you, are you assuming, assuming Stevie's not a girl? Yeah. Steve, you wouldn't <laughs> read this book. <laughs> um, and she just wrote. She wrote another book called Girl Stop Apologizing. It's just all about like breaking through. The stereotypes about being an entrepreneur as a female, you know, um, the things that we go through. I'm not a mom, but there's a lot of things that entrepreneurs go through as a female. Of you know, we're still in, we're still battling that whole man ment mentality, that guy's world. Um, even in real estate, you know, we go up against it all the time. So it's just about like having a really positive mindset about. You know, don't apologize for who you are. You know, girl, wash your face. Like, wake up, wash your face. Okay, you know, I, I got a question on this one too because, like, because I, I hear this a lot from the female side of everything, and they're, they're constantly trying to fight men and trying to, like, uh, you know, um, prove that they're strong as men and doing stuff as men. Stevie, you got to remember that they know where we live now, okay? Oh yeah. Okay. The, Where's Sean? The, hey. The, the reason why I'm saying that is because, like, there's a lot of things that women can do that men cannot do. And like if putting a feminine touch on certain things is actually probably more beneficial in doing that. So instead of like, like I've, I've, I've read a lot of things about like where women are not trying to become men, but they want to be powerful females, mm -hmm. which is a completely different aspect about it. You know, still feminine, still this, but not trying to like get into the man's world and like fucking bust around and like. And because I find that like a lot of times you'll notice that is like women will have to come across as like being almost overly aggressive in that environment to succeed in that environment. And then it comes across as like, whoa, like, why is she so aggressive? Why is she so mean? Why is she so like assertive? <laughs> Bitchy, right? When, when, when women have a, a, a feminine uh, touch to things that is way more powerful than, a, than how a man can do some stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like there's definitely, we're different. We're two different beings that have two different skill sets. Yeah. Right? And so like I can't do things like a woman just like you can't do things like a man, but like I could do it doesn't mean that I do it as well. And the same thing and back and forth, right? Yeah. So uh, like I find that, that that's the big push I find that I, I, I don't know I just notice it a lot right now too the women are just like no I'm powerful <laughs> I'm strong fuck you I mean I'm just like well, okay so much of this like boss babe thing this female hustler this whole um like movement of feminism 
um, where girls are supporting women, you know, hustle for that money, don't work, don't, you know, don't chase after that man, you know, like it's all about, there's a, there's a movement right now. And like I doing think, it by yourself and like, you know, being independent and, you know, relying on yourself, don't rely on a guy. And there's this huge movement that's going on right now where it's like, putting a fire in women's, you know, yeah. souls where they're like, you know what, yeah, I don't need a man. You know, I I want to work hard. I'm going to go after my dreams, you know. Does that mean that, you know, childbearing gets put on the back burner for a little bit for people? Yeah, it does. You know what I mean? Um, you guys can't, you guys can't get pregnant. So, like, and I think that that's one of but the biggest things. what happens things. is when women get pregnant, what happens, men get attacked right away and say, you have to pay for it. Even if the woman is not with the man, the guy is obligated to pay for it. That's not easy. I don't think it should be an obligation. I think it should be a desire. Right. That's what I'm saying. It usually should. It, this is the thing. This is where it should be. Like, if, if, like, it there should be a desire, right? Where I can basically take care of my kid, but why do I have to pay someone else to take care of them? What do you mean? Why aren't you there? No, no, you are there. But there's still there's still situations where like you're there, you're still parenting, but you have to pay for it. Like you're talking about alimony and stuff. Yeah, there's still no alimony. Is like you get divorced and you'd be like, take half, right? Dude, where are you going? What do you mean? He needs batteries. Oh, need batteries. oh they died again? Yeah. Yeah, you're out. You're out, man. People are people are stressing about you. But you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not like I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that it's wrong. What I'm saying is, is that there's two sides of the coin, right? Like to say that it's it's. I mean, there's so many scenarios with that. Like, you we'd be here all night, like yeah. talking about all the different scenarios. Like, but I think that if a guy gets a girl pregnant, and they're not together and they're not living together, I think there should be a desire for that guy to want that kid to yeah, ideally have would, a great life. And yeah. you can't breastfeed. You can't take care of the kid. You know what I mean? Like. There's a lot of things that guys can't do that the female has to do, but that means that she takes time off work. That means, you know. But what happens if the guy says, okay, you know what, that's fine. I'll formula, I'll do all stuff, I'll stay at home, I'll take care of the kids, you pay me alimony, you go to work. No, no, but that's... So <laughs> you know, like, there's those types of scenarios, but, like, that doesn't, that's not even an option sometimes. But where, when has anyone done that? When has any, any guy been like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do the formula thing. You pump your breast milk. You go back to work. I'm going to sit here. <laughs> it's not a bad gig. Like, no one. <laughs> it's not a bad gig. You get to hang out and play with kids all day. I'm sealing my lips here. <laughs> like, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying anything. What the heck? Like, do you know anyone that's ever done that? I say it's the podcast where nothing is safe. This one's a safe one for me, Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make enough money to talk on this subject, so this is on you. Yeah. Do you and have a kid? They, and it, no, no, I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, the no. yeah, hopefully not. But yeah. They're hard. It's, I can't even really speak about it because I don't have kids. You don't have kids. None of us have kids. So no. It's, it's, I've, seen, I've seen my sister with nephews, and it's like those first couple of years is fucking like... <laughs> I think, honestly... With, it's a lot of work. With children, Man. I think children's probably one of the most important jobs that can ever it is. be it's on the, the most, planet. It's that the is the most, it's important, the most job. important job. And I think that's a ball's getting dropped massively from both sides, men and women, yeah. on raising children correctly. Especially because of the fact of the matter is that uh, the programming happens between the age of one to seven. That's the most important time, mm -hmm. between one and seven. If you, if you fuck up the programming at that moment, at that time, if you don't... That, that stays with that kid for his whole life. That's happened. Like, you, our, our programming is from our parents from the ages of one to seven. That's when all the neural, uh, the neural pathways are created and they're, they're solidified. Mm -hmm. And you can't change them until you know them. And then you, it takes a long time to, to even break those habits and break those subliminal uh, patterns that we actually run at those times. So, like, it is the most important the job. The yeah, most important it is. Job. It is. That is a, from bo I think from both aspects, I mean, like I think from both the father figure as well as the the female figure. You need both. You need. I think. I think you need both. That's you just. Need both. That's just me coming mm -hmm. from Bubble St. Albert. But, like, <laughs> but both a positive, a, bubble, a, a positive male influence and a positive female influence. And mm -hmm. in an ideal situation, you'd have both parents home. Because if you're just if you're just home with like let's say the father's home and mom's out grinding it out. 
there's an imbalance between the like the child's being raised primarily by the dad and not that much of a mother. Like, it doesn't get any get any, yeah, any attention fem- from mom. Yeah. Uh, uh, any any feminine like influence. Yeah. And then the same. And vice thing, versa, the vice other versa. way around. Like dudes, dudes working in the oil field and they don't see their children for a month at a time, and they only see their kids two times a month. You know what I'm saying? When they, they do the 14 on and two off and 14 yeah, That has on an effect. And two off. I, I, I could see that happening. I, I would effect, imagine yeah. it would have an effect and like a lot of that is hard. It's difficult. But yeah, like it's a very tough everyone, situation. Everyone's, like you said, the situations, everybody's situation is completely different. Yeah, and it totally depends on the character of the person. Yeah. I mean, when it comes down to it. And uh, who, what kind of personality do they have? You know, did they want kids? Did they not want kids? It was it was a mistake? Was there's it planned? Yeah. You know, like there's so many things that could come <laughs> into play. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a freaking independent woman, so I'm like not getting into like that piece. And obviously, I can't go on mat leave. I'm on, I'm self-employed. Yeah. yeah. So well, you can get mat leave from the government, though. Uh, the government yeah. pays out mat leave and stuff like that. Um, they play paternity leave. I'm yeah, it's, sure it's, it's really different with when you're self-employed with real estate. Yeah, it's and not going to be the same when you yeah. make. And you almost like wouldn't you almost don't even want to because if you if you make a deal and you if know you sell your soul. To and the no, ND, if you sell a house, you sell like you're good NDP. for <laughs> you're good for a little while, you mm. know. Um, so we're going. Stevie always freaking. Drives the conversation wild. Okay, we're going to uh, books you've read. We we yeah, we went we to would. wash your face, girl. Now Stevie's talking about <laughs> stay at home dads and shit, pump, <laughs> pumping breast milk. This freaking guy. Hey, I'm trying to give the people like, <laughs> hey, what are some what are some like beneficial you know, things? Yeah, beneficial things. And Stevie's talking about that shit, pumping. Pumping breast yeah, milk. I saw that one video. Himself. I saw that one video where the girl was on the on the news talking about how how uh, breastfeeding is is become a fad and like they should do natural feeding with uh, formula. <laughs> the guy almost lost his shit. He goes, "Did she just say natural feeding with formula?" <laughs> it's like, and it literally that's what like you have to watch the clip. Sorry, man. No, that makes that makes. Kind you of know sense. what? You should start breastfeeding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can milk anything with nipples. Yeah, can you? Dude, that's from Zoolander, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, can you milk my cat? Or can you milk me or whatever? I can milk anything with nipples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember that? I do remember that's that. That's a classic scene. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. hilarious. All right, so we got... We have books. Yeah. We got books. Dare to Lead. I just started reading that. Which way? What is it called? Dare to Lead. Dare to Lead, yeah. That's a leadership book. Who writes leadership, that one? Uh, I, can't, I can't remember offhand yeah, yeah. who wrote it. But Dare to Lead, Google it. Mm-hmm. Great book. Um, I'll yeah. Re- I'll re-listen to these and put them in our show notes on the episode. Okay. It'll be like Jacqueline Bailey's top five books. How many yeah. have you listed so far? Three? We're on four. We're on four, four right five. now. Four. There's the CERN book. There's the Wash Your Face Girl. The other female book. And then Dare to Lead. Yeah, and then Maximize Living from Brendan Burchard. Which is a really oh, yeah, that's, book. yeah, yeah. We put yeah. that one on there. Yeah. He's a really, really, I mean, honestly... I'm a big podcast person too, and he has an awesome podcast. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. who is this guy? Is Brandon he, Bouchard. Is he all over YouTube? Yeah, is like he he's big, big time. Yeah, he got big. Like, yeah, he's the guy who just he shows up. Before, he's like a, you know, Ty Lopez. Like Ty Lopez did all that. Where like you'd try and watch a music video, and his Ty Lopez ad pops up. Oh really? Yeah. Well. The Brendan Bouchard guy. Every time I try and watch a freaking movie, or not a movie, but I listen to a song, it's like, I think hey, it, this I is think the top five things that I you need to do if you want to be successful. I think it's linked to your the motivation. It's like the same thing. Talia Lopez comes up because it's, it's a specific type of search engine. It's targeting yeah. you specifically. I don't think she's ever heard of Ty Lopez. No. Yeah. So that's the guy with the la- the picture. Ty Lopez, you got to pay us. Ty, he's, Ty he's Lopez, they're gonna he's send the guy you. Guy who's the, like, he's like, you know what I love dude, more I, about having my Lamborghini, and he's doing like, a, he's got a selfie. You never seen that like, one? No. Well, okay, so this classic. guy, I've watched this guy from when he first started off, and I swear to God, he literally rent. I, he I did think a fake he, it till you make it. I think he did fake it till you make it. And he rented a Lamb, he rented a Ferrari. It was a Lamborghini a, or a Lamborghini, and a and a bookshelf full of books. And he basically said, "You see that Ferrari on there." I really love that Ferrari, but what I actually appreciate more these is these books behind me on my shoulder. And he did that, and he was selling mentorship programs. And then all of a sudden, it went from like just that like empty garage with just the book and the Ferrari to like a mansion 
and like a whole fleet of cars. And then and then he 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 walks around with his phone fronting like it's like no big deal. He's like, yeah, I'm just in the just in the courtyard of my twenty thousand dollars square. I'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're over by the swimming pool, but uh, he always does it's Olympic size. It's not that big, but you know. But he just like. He just markets that way, like yeah. he just like shows off without showing off. And it's hilarious because really like you like you watch 15 minutes because you're just like because all right guys, I'm gonna show you three, I'm gonna show you three ways to actually like you know change your life and do your stuff. You know, as I'm giving you a quick tour of my house, you know, like um, you know, so you know this, you know, this is this, and then he'll go off on tangents because these three things are the most important things though on how to get most of this stuff and this you gotta do these. Three. You know what, man? This video's been going on. Do the a link, little too link long. Below, yeah. I'm just gonna put the link below. It's totally free. Just click the link below, and uh, and yeah, I'm just sending your email address, and I'll I'll send you the uh, the three most important things to do. All right, guys. I'll see you guys on the other side. We kept you for 15 minutes showing off all of the shit. Be like, show me the stuff. Show me the stuff. And then you have to like pipe in your email address, and then he just markets to you that way. It's like yeah, every video he does is exactly the same. Brilliant. It was super smart. Yeah, it was smart. You, you're kind of mad at the end of it. You're like, fuck, I want to know what the three things to be successful. Uh, but then you're like, I'm going to sign up for this. Yeah, I'm going to sign up for this because he's doing it. But like at, at the beginning, I think there's like a, not a conspiracy out there, but I think a lot of it was rented. Like he rented a bunch of it. Because you could, you could pretend you have the best life in the world on Instagram if you just... Like you could rent a yacht. I don't know. Like just invest, invest like in a week and like yeah, yeah. You something. Can pay a thousand bucks for for a Lamborghini and record that video. If that means that video cost him a thousand dollars, which he did on his iPhone, bookshelf full of things, and it made him a multi multi billionaire, right? Like because he he pushed that video for three years, that one video, and yeah. then and then he started doing uh, people were doing parodies of that video. Yeah, too. and then he started doing after he did that. Then he started doing uh, book of the week. So that's what you would sign up for. So you're paying for his mentorship program, and then he would literally. You signed up for it. I never signed up for it. Oh, I, 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 I you got inside I track, people. I got no. I tracked him quite a bit and heavily, but he would do like little snippets of it. So he would record. So he he built a program about two or three years deep because that's about how long you would keep people on paying him monthly. So if people dropping off by three years or four years, he doesn't need to keep making a year four, or year five uh, investment program, right? He knows that people join, join in and they last for two to three years. So he only has to make the program four years long or three and a half years long, right? Mm -hmm. So that many months because he knows they drop off. And then he just markets and then pumps people through the program. And they pay him $67, $67 a month. Every month they pay to go through this program and watch all his videos of like him talking about which books to read, what the book's about, this and that, like what the steps are. Like, Man, that is the power of social media right there. Yeah. And that's what he does. People pay him sixty-seven dollars a month, and sixty-seven. Where did that number come from? Why is that a powerful number? Because it's not seventy, and it's not sixty-nine. <laughs> but it's not sixty-five. Yeah. But it's not fifty. Yeah, it's like a good number. Like yeah. you know, those infomercials. Like you know, like infomercials. They're freaking smart in their marketing. You know, like the four easy payments in nineteen ninety-five. Like they get you with that. Really. Oh man! And then they're the like, red, yeah. you know what? And we're gonna double your we're order double for free. Your shit. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> yeah, no. Free if you buy no it today, shipping. we're gonna double it today. For free. You it's know? like, how much is this thing actually worth if you can give me two times the amount of it <laughs> for free? Yeah, you just four not easy payments yeah, for of four easy payments. Yeah, the guy's still making double the money on it. Oh, holy shit, that's hilarious. That's crazy. <laughs> okay, what's the next thing? What's the last thing? How do people get a hold of you? If people want to buy a house, how do they find you? Oh, uh, well, you can find me on Instagram. My what? personal Instagram is Jacqueline.Bailey. Our team Instagram is Exclusive Edmonton. I mean, or you can call me, text me. Do I give my number on here? Well, do you normally give people your number? Random people your number? No. Like, do you post it on your Instagram? Not really. Yeah, like, don't, don't yeah, I wouldn't give. I wouldn't give. Yeah, these sorry. Find your me number. on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Slide into my DM. <laughs> in a professional. Manner. In a professional way. In a professional, in a professional way. Betty, keep it. Keep it yeah. professional. <laughs> yeah, keep it professional. Keep it G. G. Yeah, this is slide in the DMs if you want to buy a house. If you want to buy a house, this is none of this. Did I just say that? <laughs> that was hilarious. And what's the? Uh, what is it? Is it exclusive? What? Uh, our team is exclusive Edmonton. Exclusive Edmonton. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, sweet. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. You want to close it off? That's you, man. You can close it off. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, you yeah, guys. Yeah, it was awesome. All right. Yeah. So if you guys want to get a hold of her, Jack and Bailey, exclusive Edmonton. Take care, guys. See ya. Peace out, guys. Peace out. Peace. Can't fuck this shit. Stevie. Stevie can't swear. <laughs>